Hi, so this is Kate Hussein, your lecture instructor. I know that I haven't gotten a chance to meet you guys in person yet, and I'm really looking forward to that later this week, but I wanted to make sure that you get the lecture posted for today. Um, if you did your reflection last week, you know that I have a newborn, so I'm sorry in advance for any crying that you might hear in the background. Uh, she'll be with me on Friday, so you'll get to see the source of that. Um, but we're going to start out by talking about Learning Unit 2. So you may have noticed that with Learning Unit 1, um, there is kind of a review at the start of the semester about Bio 5 and Bio 20. And the reason for that is some of you very recently took those classes, but others of you took them quite some time ago. So we want to make sure everyone is caught up, speaking the same language of biology, and prepared to delve into the physiology starting next week. So as I go through and talk specifically about the digestive system, there's going to be some stuff about function, so thinking about physiology, but we'll get really in-depth on that next week. So when I'm talking about sections and learning units, there's a course roadmap posted in the first module, which is the getting started module. That kind of uh, helps to organize the course into kind of bite-sized units, so you know kind of why we're going in a certain order. Um, so this first section is the human body and chemical organization, breaking apart and building up molecules. So all of the lectures and labs that we're doing right now are kind of addressing that general theme. And this week and next week, we're going to specifically be talking about the cellular and tissue level of organization, getting into the digestive system and talking about nutrition. So one thing to notice is that because this is an online class, there's going to be a lot more text on the slides than I usually have. Um, I know a lot of you have taken classes with me before, so some of the slides will look kind of familiar, others will have a lot more information. Um, so looking right now at week two, which is what we're in, uh, I'm kind of talking about what we're doing in lecture, an overview of chapters three and four. So thinking about cell and tissue levels of organization, getting us all caught up to speed on bio five and bio 20, and getting into chapter 23, which is about the digestive system. So quick side note, when I'm talking about those different chapters, I'm referring to chapters in the OpenStax lecture textbook. So please make sure that you have that PDF or that you have it open on a browser um, so that you know what I'm referring to and that you have additional context. Um, it's not a huge deal if you don't buy the hard copy. It's about $50 on Amazon. You can if you want to, but uh, what I really encourage you to do is use the slides. Um, I'm a big believer in accessibility and making sure that students have all the resources they need right in front of them. So I really base my study guides, my quizzes, and my exams off of the information that I choose to present to you in the slides. So the slides should be a very good representation of what you're going to be tested on. Um, in lab this week, you're talking about the metric system, biochemistry, so thinking back to some of those chemical building blocks that you saw in lecture last week, um, calorimetric tests, and then next week, we're going to start getting more into the physiology, so we're going to integrate chapter 23 that we're talking about today with chapter 24, metabolism and nutrition. And in lab, you'll be talking about enzymes, which will tie in really neatly with what we're doing in lecture. I have some learning objectives stated here. Um, these should help kind of uh, prepare you for the quiz and for the lecture exams. So skim these over on your own time. Make sure that you can meet these learning outcomes. So we're going to start out by doing a quick review of chapters three and four. Chapter three is the cellular level of organization. Chapter four is the tissue level of organization. Um, so when we go through different chapters, what I'll do is I'll put sections here. Uh, sometimes the sections will have additional information about what specifically you should focus on. I'm telling you right now that for this, these two chapters, chapters three and four, it's really just a review to make sure that you have the correct terminology, getting into physiology, kind of making sure you're speaking that language that you learned in anatomy so that you're prepared to understand the material. So chapters three and four are primarily for you to review and head into the physiology part feeling confident. When we go over chapter 23, I have a bit more details, which we'll talk about in a little bit. 
So this is a slide from last week. Um, I like to remind students of slides that you've seen before to remind you that this stuff doesn't exist in a vacuum. You are learning and building off of a foundation. So you saw this slide last week when you were talking about levels of structural organization from chapter one. And we're gonna start out by talking about cells. So remember by cells, we mean the smallest independently functioning unit of a living organism. There's some level of organization inside of them with those organelles, specifically in eukaryotic cells like ours. So when we're thinking about cells, we're kind of moving outward and going inward, thinking about the differences between the internal environment of the cell and the external environment. And when we're thinking about the distinction, that's happening at that phospholipid bilayer. So we have these hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails that kind of self-aggregate and form this bilayer that protects the internal environment of the cell. So there's a lot of fluid in our body. We are primarily water. We have a lot of water content in us, but the stuff that's in the water makes a really big difference. And it's very different inside of our cells versus outside of our cells. So inside of our cells, we call that liquid the intracellular fluid or ICF. Outside, we call it the extracellular fluid or ECF. And another term for that is interstitial fluid or IF. So there's a lot of acronyms there. Um, and whenever I write quizzes or exams, I write out everything that a certain term is called. So if I was asking you a question, I'd ask you about extracellular fluid and then put in parentheses ECF, interstitial fluid, IF. So you're never gonna be dependent on just knowing one of those terms. I want to make sure it's fair. So when we're thinking about that phospholipid bilayer, um, it looks like a very simple bilayer, but it's actually quite messy. And we describe it using something called the fluid mosaic model. Um, I have a video that I'll show you in just a moment, but just so you can kind of anticipate what's embedded in that fluid mosaic model and what helps make it so messy and beautiful and functional. We have some integral membrane proteins. Those are these proteins uh, that are really integrated into the membrane. They're embedded in the membrane and they span the whole membrane. We have channel proteins, which are similar in structure to integral membrane proteins, but they're open and they selectively allow material through. So they're channels. We also have glycoproteins, which are attached to the external surface of the cell. Those are involved in cell recognition. And we have peripheral membrane proteins. So if you look at this guy, it's kind of uh, offset towards the internal environment of the cell. So these are not spanning the entire membrane the way that integral membrane proteins or channel membrane proteins are. So it's really messy. And if we can maybe capture this video, I'm hoping it works out. Um, this is a panorama video uh, of an artist rendition of the cell membrane. So uh, this is kind of like those videos on Facebook where people do 360 capture of whatever's around them and you can move your phone around. Um, I actually found this video on Facebook and the version that's posted to Facebook, you can kind of travel through the cell membrane, which is really awesome. And I encourage you to open it up if you get a chance. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea. So we can see we're inside this environment of the cell. We're kind of are inside the cell membrane specifically. We can see it's really messy. And if we oh, kind of move around here, um, it was working earlier. Let's see, maybe not. Okay. I'm not going to let you guys do that on your own. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I practiced right before I did the recording, but it's not working. So you should be able to click those um, four arrows and kind of drag it around. Uh, maybe it just doesn't like being recorded while it's doing that. Um, but you can try that on your own time and kind of explore that fluid mosaic model. Okay. 
Um, so when we're thinking about how stuff crosses that membrane, we can think about the proteins themselves, those channels, but we also describe it based on the energy cost and kind of the gross movement. So we think about passive transport, which might be diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Remember that diffusion is the movement of stuff from a high concentration to a low concentration. So it's moving along its own concentration gradient. Diffusion can happen just kind of passively across the membrane. It's by definition a passive process, meaning it does not cost any ATP, any cell energy, or it can be facilitated by moving through some of those channel proteins. Um, so it might need to have some space to work through, but regardless, diffusion doesn't cost energy, it's passive. So when we say active transport, we mean a process that does require ATP. We'll talk about sodium potassium pumps in just a moment. That might be familiar to you. But when we say active, we mean that it costs ATP. Osmosis is basically the diffusion of water. It's a passive transport of a solvent, generally water, across a membrane. Uh, you might have seen the movie Osmosis Jones quite some time ago, um, but that's what that's referring to. We also have these more dynamic processes called exocytosis and endocytosis. So when you look at those words, they look pretty similar, but exo means outside, endo means inside, and cyto is cell, um, and then we have movement. So Exocytosis is the formation of a vesicle packaging something up inside of the cell. It moves towards the plasma membrane, kind of integrates into the plasma membrane, and then is released outside. So it's moving outside of the cell. Endocytosis is the opposite process. It's something moving into the cell. It gets packaged using the plasma membrane and then moved inside of a vesicle inside the cell. So when we're thinking about what's actually inside of the cell, we kind of distinguish between different main components. So we have the cytosol, um, that's a fluid medium within the cell that has a very specific chemical composition. Uh, we'll talk about that on the next slide. There's also organelles. These are structures that are within the cell that perform specific functions. So they're kind of like the mini organs of the cells. There's differentiation involved. Um, so we have things like the nucleus, mitochondria, lysosomes, the Golgi apparatus, things that you've probably heard of before that are um, often membrane bound, but ribosomes are not. Uh, so these are important for functioning in eukaryotic cells, especially because they have a much higher volume relative to their surface area, so they need a lot of extra help inside of the cell. When we say cytoplasm, we mean all of that stuff put together. So it's the cytosol, it's the organelles, it's the cytoskeleton that helps maintain its structure, all of those filament proteins, um, so that's important. Uh, I always used to get confused about the distinction between cytosol and cytoplasm. Um, cytosol is specifically that solution, that sol inside of the cell. Cytoplasm, if you think about like blood plasma, there's a lot of stuff in there. So cytoplasm is not just the liquid, it's the cytosol and the organelles and the cytoskeleton. So when we're thinking about what actually makes up the cytosol, there's a lot of numbers on this slide and you do not need to memorize all of them. But what I do want you to pay attention to is this high amount of potassium ions and low amount of sodium. So that ratio where potassium is about 139 millimolar and sodium is at about 12 millimolar is important for osmoregulation. Keep that in mind when we talk about excretion later in the semester. And then also the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump is what cells spend a lot of their ATP on. It's really important, especially for propagating action potentials. So we'll talk about that later as well. Most of the cytosol though is water. It's about 70% of the cell's volume and it's kept at a pH of about seven to 7.4. There's a lot of other macromolecules as well. So things like proteins. So when we're thinking about cells, Remember that every cell in your body has the same textbook that kind of makes you who you are. It's a code that codes for all the stuff that makes you unique. So we have this relationship between the DNA code 
an mRNA transcript and protein products. Um, the relationship exists through this process. It's not that anything gets turned into anything else. The DNA acts as a code for mRNA through transcription and the function of the enzyme RNA polymerase. We have this polymerization of RNA to make an mRNA transcript. That is kind of this transient molecule that's going to code for a protein. Um, it's going to be read by ribosomes, and in the process of translation, we're going to assemble a protein product. So there's this inherent relationship between your genotype and your phenotype. The way that I think about different cell processes uh, that have to do with DNA is that you have this cookbook that's who you are. Uh, if you go through DNA replication, it's like you're photocopying the whole cookbook. Transcription is specifically, let's say you have a recipe you want to use, you don't want to have the whole textbook or cookbook open, so you just jot down that recipe, you have this transcript, and then you translate it. You cook from that recipe to make a protein product. So this whole process can be called expression, and there's a lot of different synonyms involved in this idea of central dogma. So when uh, we talk about central dogma, we are also talking about transcription and translation, protein expression, and gene expression. So in biology, there's a lot of terms that generally mean the same thing. Um, there might be a slightly different take on it, but it's all about this coding relationship between DNA and proteins. So the reason I'm talking about this is because I want you to kind of understand differentiation and where that comes from. All of our cells have this cookbook, but the way it's expressed in different cells is a little bit different. Um, we have lots of genes which are coding sequences of DNA, and differences in that expression of those genes allows for differentiation of cell types. So let's say that we have this stretch of DNA, one gene might assemble a polypeptide, one gene might code for a regulatory RNA, one gene might code for a transfer RNA. So we have a lot of different types of coding happening here. So those differences in protein expression are very key for differentiation of cell types. But remember, we all start out as a single cell with two sets of DNA, one from one parent and one from the other parent. So the way that we get to be these extraordinarily complex creatures are through the differentiation of stem cells. So you might have heard of embryonic stem cells. At an early point in development, we have this bundle of embryonic stem cells. Um, stem cells can also be found in your umbilical cord blood and also in some adult tissue. Um, we're going to talk when we talk about digestion about particular organs that might have a lot of stem cells. So these stem cells are undifferentiated to some extent. They can go on to become many different types of cells. There's lots of different types of stem cells though. Um, the most powerful ones are totipotent. They have total potential. They can differentiate into any type of cell needed for an organism to grow and develop. Pluripotent stem cells have plural potential. So they have some potential, but not as much as totipotent. They develop from totipotent stem cells and they're precursor to a type of tissue layer, but they can't make a whole organism. So then we have um, increasingly limited types of stem cells. We have multipotent, so multiple potential. Within a single lineage, you have different specialized cells arising from these guys. There's oligopotent. Um, oligo means a few, so an oligonucleotide is a sequence of a few nucleotides of DNA. Um, an oligarchy is control uh, by just a few people. So oligopotent uh, have the potential to become a few cell types. And then unipotent is very specialized, but you can still get more cells. It's just the same type of cell. So the way I think about stem cells is it's kind of like those Pokemon that can evolve into many different types of Pokemon. Um, so you have this starter Pokemon, it evolves, and then it can't really go back. Um, but once you, when you are in that early state, you have the potential to become lots of different things. So that was kind of a recap of cells as a level of organization. But when we have cells together, many different types of cells or similar cells um, kind of working together, 
we have tissue. So I'm gonna do a brief review of tissue as well before we get into digestion. So when we're thinking about tissue, we use this term histology. It's the microscopic study of tissue appearance, organization, and function. So if you see the word histology or histological, we're talking specifically about tissue. So within the human body, there's four types of tissue. There's epithelial, which is also called epithelium. These are covering exterior surfaces like your skin, internal cavities, and passageways. There's also connective tissue, which is important for connecting things. It binds cells and organs together, it protects, it supports, and it integrates different parts of the body. Epithelial and connective tissue are gonna be very important for today, and they work together a lot of the time. Uh, connective is really important for supporting epithelial tissue. We also have muscle and nervous tissue. We're not gonna stress about those as much right now because we are gonna spend a lot more time on them later in the semester. So when we're thinking about connective tissue, this is a supportive structure. And when we have a connective tissue membrane, that is just made up of connective tissue because it's strong enough and elastic enough to really exist on its own. Um, so that is involved in encapsulating organs. It lines movable joints. If you think back to your knowledge of a synovial joint, we have connective tissue there. Um, and it also, uh, so like I've just mentioned, lines the cavity of a freely movable joint. So when we're thinking about epithelial membranes, those are not just epithelial cells or epithelial tissue, it's epithelium attached to a layer of connective tissue. So epithelial membranes have both epithelial cells and connective tissue. One type of epithelial membrane is a mucous membrane. Those are important for lining body cavities and hollow passageways um, that open to the external environment and they produce mucus. So the way they produce mucus is using these guys called goblet cells, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Um, when we're saying a passageway that opens to the external environment, we are thinking about our respiratory tract, we're thinking about our digestive system. So if something has to interact with the external environment, it's helpful to have a mucous membrane. There's also serous membranes. Those, again, are lining cavities, but they line cavities that don't open to the external environment. So these are a different type of epithelial membrane. Um, the sac that covers your heart, the pleura that surround your lungs, and the peritoneum are all examples of serous membranes. Pay close attention to that peritoneum on the right side of the slide because that's gonna come into play during the digestive system. Another type of epithelial membrane is the cutaneous membrane. That should make you think about the skin. Um, it's stratified squamous epithelial cells uh, on top of connective tissue. And so this is when you're exposed to the external environment. Um, it's not lining stuff inside of the body. Epithelial tissues are very diverse. Um, I want to point out that some of them might be ciliated. So there are some kind of unique structural components. This slide is basically reviewed just from Bio 20. They also have distinct orientation. So when we're thinking about cells, we kind of uh, line them up based on exposure. There's the apical surface, which is the exposed surface of the cell. There's the basal surface, which is closer to underlying body structures. Um, so if we have something like the small intestine, the apical surface is what's towards the lumen, the basal is what's towards the outer portion of the small intestine. So this is a point of attachment for connective tissue. Epithelial tissues also have uh, very unique types of cell junctions that hold them together um, kind of laterally and in different ways. So there's tight junctions, which do not allow material to pass through. Um, tight junctions might be located on the apical or basal surfaces. Um, they kind of hold things together very firmly. There's anchoring junctions, which are a little bit more flexible, and gap junctions, which allow movement of small molecules and ions to allow for coordination of function. Gap junctions are super important for the car cardiac system, which we'll talk about later. 
um, tight junctions are going to be extremely important when we're thinking about the histology, so the tissue of the stomach. So keep those tight junctions in mind. Epithelial tissue also has a lot of stuff kind of embedded in it. I mentioned those goblet cells uh, earlier, and so those are going to be really important for the digestive system. So when we think about tissue, we also think about glands. Glands are these structures that synthesize and secrete different chemical substances, so different signaling molecules, and they're often made up of epithelial cells, so now is a good time to kind of touch on them. Um, there's endocrine glands and exocrine glands. So remember, endo is inside, exo is outside. Endocrine doesn't have any ducts attached to them. It's just having these hormones directly released into surrounding tissue and fluids. For exocrine glands, the secretions have to leave the body. So they're leaving through a duct. Um, so that could be uh, mucus, it could be sweat, saliva, breast milk, um, different components of chemical digestion. So when you go through the slides for digestion, um, there's gonna be some examples of ducts. Uh, that's an example of exocrine function. And some organs have both endocrine and exocrine function. So the pancreas is a really important example of that um, in terms of the exocrine function, so kind of secreting stuff that's not technically inside of our body. Um, the pancreas produces this pancreatic juice, which involves both digestive enzymes and bicarbonate to kind of neutralize the acidity of um, chyme, and that will make more sense in just a moment. Um, but it's kind of uh, synthesizing this material and then exporting it to the small intestine. So it's not just releasing it, it's traveling along a duct and going into the small intestine, which is technically separate from your body. But it also has an endocrine function. So it produces different hormones like glucagon, insulin, somatostatin, and pancreatic polypeptide hormone. And it does secrete those directly into the bloodstream. So the tricky thing about anatomy is that you can study something as being part of one particular system, but the physiology is a little bit more nuanced than that. So there's also a connective tissue. Um, so we kind of talked about epithelial tissue, um, but just to kind of remind you, connective tissue is very important for supporting and protecting. There's lots of different types of connective tissue, but the thing that they have in common is that the tissue cells themselves are dispersed inside of a matrix. Um, it's called the ground substance. So when we talk about blood, we're gonna talk about blood cells kind of dispersed within this plasma ground substance. So I'm going to let you go through the important points on your own uh, just to make sure that you kind of understand what to focus on on those slides. There's a lot of text there. But getting into the digestive system, this is what I was talking about earlier where there's specific sections that we're covering, not everything, but uh, I kind of took some time to say what you should focus on. So as we go through section one and two, we're thinking about overall function, histology, regulatory roles, so just kind of basic stuff. Um, three, four, five, and six would be good for you to review if you need an anatomy refresher, if you haven't taken it in a while, or if you were kind of shaky on it when you took your course, um, or even if you just wanna make sure you're super prepared, uh, it, that's what it's going to be more about, just kind of reminding you of the structures and basic functions. And then next week, I'm gonna spend a lot more time talking about chapter 23, section seven, as we get into chapter 24, that's going more in depth into chemical digestion and absorption. So understanding how specific macromolecules are digested and absorbed, that will hopefully prepare you a little bit more for understanding enzymes and metabolism. So 23.7 is not in this PowerPoint, it will be in next week's PowerPoint. Okay, so when we're thinking about digestion, we as humans are very focused on ourselves, right? So we have these bodies that we're in our whole lives, we're used to them, um, but the word digestion really just means breaking something down into smaller pieces. So if you're ever doing research, you might do a, a DNA digest where you cut apart pieces of DNA or restriction enzyme digest where you use a restriction enzyme to cut apart pieces of DNA. That's digestion. Digestion is just taking a big polymer, 
breaking it apart into monomers. Uh, we do that in different ways as humans. So the uh, comparison I always make is that when you eat an egg, you are not using the proteins the same way that the chicken would. You are breaking those proteins apart into their constituent pieces, and so kind of like into Lego pieces, and reassembling them into something that makes sense for you. So we break apart those polymers into monomers, we absorb the monomers into our body, we shuttle them around and repackage them and remake them into the macromolecules that we actually need. So when we talk about digestion, there's actually a few different related processes that we kind of group together into digestion. Um, one of those is ingestion, where food is entering through an open cavity. There's the actual digestion, which is the breakdown of food into smaller particles and individual nutrients. Those terms mechanical and chemical are going to come into play in just a moment. And there's absorption. Absorption is really the key to all of this. We call it the digestive system. Uh, but absorption, if you couldn't do it, it wouldn't make, it, digestion wouldn't matter. You have to have absorption. So absorption is when you have that soluble material finally crossing the plasma membrane, entering into your body tissue. So the digestive system works with a lot of other systems to accomplish all of these processes. Um, when we talk about uh, the cardiovascular system, um, or when you studied it in past semesters in anatomy, you might have talked about the hepatic portal system. So that's a very unique set of veins and capillaries that's really important for processing all of the products of digestion, all the stuff that we absorb. So it's part of the circulatory system, but it's very closely linked to absorption. Remember that hepatic means liver, so it's a hepatic portal system. It's a portal to the liver. So when we're thinking about all the different systems that are involved in digestion, we have the cardiovascular system. Um, we need a lot of oxygen to power all these cells, and uh, we need to remove waste products and move nutrients around. Uh, digestion is regulated using the endocrine system, so we have regulation through accessory organs, the lymphatic system is involved, nervous and muscular system, the skin and your urinary tract. All of this stuff is really important for digestion. So they're all interconnected in different ways. So when we're thinking about digestion, I've referenced this idea a few times that um, digest your digestive system, the process of digestion is not happening actually inside of your body. It's happening inside of something called the alimentary canal or the hollow tube. So that's technically separate from you. So if we look at uh, these preserved people who are playing hockey, we can see a lot of intestines kind of piled up there. And if we were to kind of look inside of those intestines, we would see something that looks kind of like this, where we have kind of a surrounding layer, we have all these finger-like projections, and then we have this open space on the inside. So it's kind of like looking down a hose, and that hollow tube is running throughout your body from your mouth to your anus. Um, and so we have this hollow tube, this alimentary canal, running through our body, making up our digestive system or digestive tract. So uh, this, again, is technically outside of your body. It's separate from your body. Stuff has to be absorbed through the plasma membrane of the cells that are lining that tract in order to get incorporated into us. So when we're thinking about different parts of the digestive system, we have our digestive tract. We have that alimentary canal. Um, we're, we're going to talk about specific structures involved there. But there are also accessory structures that kind of secrete stuff into our digestive system through a series of ducts, um, and those provide support to digestion without actually transporting any food. So you're not going to have food entering your salivary glands or your gallbladder or your liver. That's not where digestion is taking place, but they are involved in digestion. So before we do delve too much into the physiology next week, I did want to review some basic components of the alimentary canal in terms of the tissue and review their function. So we'll kind of start out um, 
We'll start out more internal and then move external. So we'll start with the mucosa, which is a mucous membrane. And here we have a really high rate of turnover of cells. Um, these are involved in transport and immune function, and they have a very high surface area. So when we're talking about this histology, these components are there throughout the alimentary canal, but some portions of the alimentary canal are going to have other unique structures, so just keep that in mind. So we have the mucosa, and then outside of that we have the submucosa. So this is dense connective tissue. It has a lot of blood and lymph vessels as well as nerves. Outside of that we have the muscularis, which facilitates chemical and mecha mechanical digestion. It is important for peristalsis, which is this smooth muscle contraction that moves stuff through your alimentary canal. And we have the serosa, which is found in the abdominal cavity um, that's made of peritoneum. Remember that I mentioned that earlier when we were talking about serous membranes. Um, it's also made of loose connective tissue. There's some regions that also have dense collagen fibers. So remember that those serous membranes line cavities that don't open to the outside of our body and cover organs within those cavities. So they're lining the cavities themselves um, and they're also covering organs. So there's kind of a distinction there. So when we're talking about lining the cavities and lining the abdominal wall, we're talking about the parietal peritoneum. When we're talking about surrounding abdominal organs, we're talking about the visceral peritoneum. So what this peritoneum does is it anchors the organs in the digestive system, um, it connects different structures, and it stores fat. So it kind of keeps everything in place. The digestive system occupies a lot of space inside of your body and throughout your body. And so to keep everything organized, it's important to have this serous membrane. It also has a lot of watery fluid kind of floating around it um, and through it, and so that's important for reducing friction. So I mentioned that there are a lot of different processes involved in digestion. I've mentioned kind of mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. So we're gonna kind of separate those out. We have ingestion, which is ingestion and propulsion. We have digestion, which is both mechanical and chemical. We have absorption, and we also have defecation, which is also called elimination. So we have these separate processes that are all key for the overall process of digestion. When we're talking about ingestion, there's kind of a couple different parts to that. We have the food entering into our mouth. Um, at that point, there's gonna be some chemical and mechanical digestion also occurring but the important thing is getting that food in, so ingesting it. And then there's propulsion into the rest of the alimentary canal. So that propulsion is both voluntary through the swallowing and also involuntary through this process of peristalsis. So peristalsis is something that's happening a lot in your esophagus and other parts of your alimentary canal. You can't go to GB3 and work out your esophagus. It's an involuntary process. So that peristalsis is just this contracting and relaxing of that muscle to move something called a bolus down from your mouth into your stomach. So when we say bolus here, we're not talking about a bolus like on an IV, we're talking about a bolus of food, which is this kind of ground up food that's been kind of processed already in your mouth and is ready to travel into your stomach. At the same time as ingestion, we have some mechanical breakdown. And the important part of mechanical breakdown is breaking down food into smaller pieces to increase surface area. So increasing surface area makes different processes more efficient. If you have more surface area, you can have more enzymatic reactions, you have more exposure to chemical or to different acids or different things like that. So for chemical digestion, um, so if you think about like a really hot day, if you wanna cool down a glass of water, you don't put one big ice cube in your glass, you put that good crushed ice inside of it to increase surface area, to increase the surface for uh, interactions to occur. So we do this through chewing. Um, we also you know, cut food apart. You don't just swallow a whole steak like a snake. Um, you cut food apart, you chew it, you masticate it, um, and then it's more prepared for chemical digestion. 
Uh, something that I always like to share with my students around this time is gizzards. Uh, so some of you might have eaten gizzards before and uh, birds don't have teeth. They have these special organs called gizzards where when they're pecking the ground, they also swallow stones. Um, and so as they eat, the food gets ground up by their stones and uh, that's a form of mechanical breakdown. There's also this process of segmentation, which is occurring in the small intestine that isolates different pockets of food. Um, so it kind of keeps things mechanically separate um, to kind of squish things around, allowing for chemical digestion and also increased absorption, which is happening in the small intestine. In terms of chemical breakdown, that starts right away when you put food into your mouth, specifically carbohydrates. So carbohydrates get broken down using the enzyme amylase, which you have in your saliva. So if you've ever had that experience of chewing bread and having it get sweeter and sweeter, um, the reason for that is because those big complex carbohydrates in the bread are getting broken down into smaller sugars, into their monomers using amylase and we perceive those smaller sugars to be sweeter. Um, so we have amylase in our saliva, we have enzymes and acid in our stomach, which is gonna help produce something called chyme. Um, and we have a lot of, you know, those enzymes that are breaking down now these larger molecules into smaller monomers. So it's not just breaking food apart into smaller pieces, it's actually getting into the molecules and breaking apart those bonds so that we get those small Lego pieces that we can absorb. So when we're thinking about that enzymatic chemical breakdown, when we're thinking about those specific polymers, those macromolecules that are made up of monomers, there's a really unique structure function relationship. So we have specific enzymes to break down specific macromolecules. Um, we have amylase or you know, different classes of these enzymes to break apart carbohydrates into simple sugars. We have proteases, which break apart proteins into amino acids. We have nucleases, which break nucleic acids down into nucleotides. And we have lipases, which break down lipids into fatty acids. Um, one thing that I like to remind students is that in biology, there's a lot of terms, but again, it's like speaking a language. So whenever you see that ASE ending, it's telling you this is a protein that does something. It's an enzyme, and usually the first part of the word will tell you what it does. So earlier when I mentioned RNA polymerase, ACE means it's an enzyme that polymerizes RNA. Here we have nuclease, that's an enzyme that breaks apart nucleic acids. Lipase is an enzyme that breaks apart lipids. So instead of just trying to memorize everything, make sure you're paying attention to those rules and learning the language so that you have an easier time of it. Um, this process of chemical breakdown also involves water, acids, and salts. Um, and whenever you mess around with pH, there has to kind of be a balance to that to maintain homeostasis, which is where a lot of those accessory organs come into play. So after the food is processed and it's ready to get absorbed, we have the process of absorption. Um, keep in mind that we talk about the small intestine and the large intestine in terms of absorption, but there's also a lot of chemical digestion still happening in your small intestine. So with absorption, we have uh, soluble material crossing the plasma membrane. Our small intestine has a huge amount of surface area due to these things called villi, which we'll talk about in a little bit. This is when you actually move stuff from the lumen into your cells and goes into circulation in your body. So you finally have access to it. So I mentioned earlier that if you can't absorb, then digestion really doesn't matter. And one example of that is celiac disease. So some of you might have heard of celiac disease. A lot more of you probably have heard of people avoiding gluten. So uh, one of the reasons why people might choose to avoid gluten or might need to avoid gluten is this autoimmune disease called celiac disease. What happens in this situation is your body mounts an immune response against gluten. So whenever you eat food that has gluten in it, like bread, your body has an immune response. It produces an antibody, which you can test for. 
uh, and it damages villi in your small intestine. So you go from having a lot of surface area in your small intestine to not much at all, and they can no longer effectively absorb nutrients from your digestive tract. So you can have a perfectly healthy diet and still not be getting access to those nutrients. Just because something is there doesn't mean we can process it or absorb it. So there's a lot of symptoms involved here. Um, you can really see uh, using these uh, endoscopic images um, how on the top row there's a lot of surface area still. You can see all the coils where those villi are. Um, in the prepared slide you can see the huge amount of surface area, but in the bottom row you can see the tissue is much smoother, there's none of those finger-like projections. So you don't have anything reaching in and grabbing the nutrients out of the lumen. You end up with a lot of malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies, chronic diarrhea because stuff's just moving through you, you're at a higher risk for cancers, and if you have these growth intensive processes like being a young child or growing a fetus, there's going to be a lot of complications. So once stuff does pass through, it gets eliminated. Sometimes that might be more than others. Um, if you have different disease states, then elimination can tell you a lot of information about that. Um, but in general, we don't have the enzymes, the ability or the need to break down and absorb everything we ingest. So stuff ends up passing through our body. I want to point out that, um, so first that this is feces. We have feces being produced. And also that this is a completely separate process from excretion. So a lot of times when student hear, students hear that word excretion, they think about feces, but the excretory system is specifically nitrogenous waste from the kidneys. So um, it is a lot of other stuff too, but that's urine. So elimination is feces excretion is urine. There's a lot of, again, different systems involved in regulating the um, digestive system. There's neural controls. So when we were talking about the histology, we talked about how there's um, nerve, nerve endings, uh, kind of different sensory receptors throughout the submucosa. There's a lot of reflexes involved, and there's also a lot of hormonal controls as well. Gastrin is one of the most important ones of those. Okay, so to briefly review the structures, I'm just gonna kind of run through this because it is a lot of anatomy, which you should have already taken. Um, when we talk about the upper alimentary canal, we're talking about the mouth, the pharynx, and the esophagus. So again, ingesting, starting to chemically and mechanically digest, and then moving stuff into the stomach. And the lower alimentary canal, we have the stomach, the small and large intestines, and of course the rectum and the anus. Um, we also have the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas as accessory organs. The stomach is very flexible. Um, it can range in size quite a lot, and it has a lot of unique histology to it. And it also is really important for slowly letting material into the small intestine. So it is a very carefully controlled process. To kind of review some of the unique structures on the stomach, um, there's the cardia towards the uh, superior portion, which is where you have the esophagus connecting to the stomach. You have the pylorus, which is the stomach connecting to the duodenum, which is the top or the superior portion of your small intestine. And one really important muscle here is that pyloric sphincter, which control, controls the flow of chyme from the stomach into the small intestine. Uh, your stomach is very muscular, and when it's deflated, you have these curves of muscle called rugae. There's a lot of curvature to your stomach, which you should have noticed in anatomy. Um, and then uh, one thing that I also want to point out is that even though your stomach has these kind of protections for itself, um, there's some bacteria that can kind of get in there and take advantage of it and change the pH. Um, so you might have heard of stomach ulcers or H. pylori infections. Helicobacter pylori burrows into that mucus lining in the stomach and actually produces enzymes that change the pH of the stomach. Um, so you have the situation where your stomach's becoming increasingly alkaline in specific 
parts and then it has to produce more and more acid so you have these ulcers being formed. So when you mess around with the um, pH of the stomach, that can cause problems, but usually there's some homeostatic mechanisms in place to keep everything the way it should be. The stomach also has this additional muscle layer, the oblique layer, which helps with mechanical and chemical digestion. Your stomach is churning food, moving it around, really making sure that all that surface area of the food gets exposed to chemicals. And we have the secretion of alkaline mucus. So this is important uh, to, again, maintain homeostasis. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, and there's also these gastric glands, which are important for secreting gastric juice that includes hormones like gastrin, which I mentioned earlier. So when we're thinking about that mucosal barrier, when we're thinking about that alkaline mucus, um, just like how H. pylori is protected by creating an alkaline environment, your stomach has to be protected from this really low pH environment, otherwise it would digest itself. Um, the low in pH environment is important because acid can kind of help to break stuff up. Um, a lot of enzymes are also activated in that low pH environment, but it's not necessarily great for the tissue that makes up the stomach. So we have this mucus layer that is really rich in bicarbonate that's going to physically and chemically protect from that low pH environment. We have those tight junctions that I mentioned earlier that hold the cells together and provide physical protection. And there's a lot of stem cells, which I also mentioned earlier, allowing for rapid replacement of all the epithelial cells lining your stomach every three to six days. So your stomach is constantly overturning those cells, which means that even if there is some damage, the cells will get replaced. So after the stomach, after the pyloric sphincter, we enter the small intestine, and this is crucial. Basically, anything else in your digestive system you can replace or supplement in some way. The small intestine is the one where there's really no replacement for it. You have to have it in order to absorb and fully continuing processing um, all of that food. So most chemical digestion and almost all absorption occurs in the small intestine. And there's a huge amount of surface area there. We think about our skin being um, this huge organ, but uh, the small intestine actually has 100 times more surface area than the skin. So when we're thinking about the different parts of the small intestine, we have the duodenum, which I mentioned. Um, this has something called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Hepato meaning liver, pancreatic meaning pancreas. Um, sphincter is a circular muscular opening. So that's going to regulate the flow of bile from the liver and the gallbladder and pancreatic juice from the pancreas, um, which are involved in chemical digestion. Uh, so we have these um, exocrine organs that are involved shuttling this, um, th these digestive juices for chemical digestion into the duodenum. We also have the jejunum kind of moving along, that's in teal, um, and so that is where we have absorption of small molecules taking place, um, so carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and some vitamins. And then the last component of the small intestine pictured in pink is the ileum. That's the longest region of the small intestine. It's highly vascularized. Um, it has bigger folds inside of it and it's integrated with the lymphatic system. So when we're talking about uh, integration with the lymphatic system, remember that your intestine, the interior of it, is technically separate from you. And so we have to have this kind of reporter system to be aware of what's traveling through it. We have these things called Peyer's patches, which are part of gut-associated gut lymphoid tissue. Um, these are important for immune surveillance, so kind of like how your tonsils will um, absorb different bacteria and kind of let your body know what's going on. Um, these Peyer patches are involved in that process as well. So like I mentioned, there's both mechanical with segmentation and chemical digestion happening inside of the small intestine. Um, chyme is very slowly entering the small intestine from the stomach. 
if you had too much chyme coming in at once, it would really throw off blood volume and pH. Um, but we have this slow entrance, this slow segmentation, um, and we have a lot of kind of movement involved here. So there's some unique structures in the small intestine. There's the circular folds, the villi, and the microvilli on individual cells. And that's all, again, important for slowing down the chyme, making sure you have maximum absorption, and maintaining a safer pH after the acidic environment of the stomach. So in thinking about function, about physiology, we have slowing down, absorbing, and homeostasis. Following the small intestine, we get into the large intestine. Those are separated by the cecum, which uh, is larger in other animals, not necessarily in us or in fetal pigs. It's a little bit harder to see. Um, some absorption is happening there. We have lymphatic tissue. It's a good storage spot for gut bacteria. Uh, but then moving forward, we have the colon, which uh, forms a unique structure kind of surrounding the small intestine. That's where a lot of water reabsorption happens and preparation of feces. So along the right side of your body, after the cecum, you have the ascending colon, which is moving superiorly. We have the transverse colon, which cuts across the left, and then the descending colon and the sigmoid colon before we get into the anal canal and the, or the rectum and the anal canal. So the rectum is where we separate feces from gas to kind of keep those separate and release them more carefully. And then the anal canal involves different sphincters with involuntary and voluntary control. The large intestine shares some histology with the small intestine, but there is less enzyme production, less surface area, lots of mucus production, lots of absorption of water, more so than in the small intestine, and we're also absorbing salt and vitamins here. For the accessory organs, we have the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. We've kind of mentioned the role of these um, earlier, but the liver produces bile, exports it to the duodenum, and it's also important for the hepatic portal system after absorption. The gallbladder is very closely linked to the liver, and the pancreas has those endocrine and exocrine functions. So to walk through those individually, the liver again produces bile. Um, it's the largest gland in the body. It weighs about three pounds in adults. And if you've ever held a human liver or dissected a fetal pig, you know that it is massive and a really unique, dense texture. Um, you kind of have to move it out of the way to access anything else. Um, there's a large right lobe, smaller left primary lobes. So we kind of see this structure right here. Um, I talked about this in chapter one, but I realized maybe some of you didn't review that or forget. Um, whenever we look at organs or systems or bones, we're always looking at it in terms of anatomical position. So our right is their left. Um, so when I talk about a large right lobe, it's on your left side, but the patient's, in quote, um, right side. So the large right and smaller left primary lobes. Um, and then there's some unique structures involved there as well. The gallbladder is kind of tucked behind or posteriorly on the uh, liver. And so the gallbladder is important for storing, concentrating, and releasing bile. And by bile, we mean this alkaline solution of water, bile salts, pigments, phospholipids, electrolytes, cholesterol, and triglycerides. This is really important for emulsifying and absorbing lipids. So you can actually live without your gallbladder. My dad had his removed, um, but the gallbladder is important for having a reservoir of bile. So basically, if you don't have one, you just have to keep a low lipid diet. Uh, you can't really eat a lot of red meats. Um, so it's, it's something you can live without, but it does affect quality of life. And then there's the pancreas. We've talked about quite a bit already. Um, there's uh, unique cell structures. Um, I'm realizing that it says the next chapter, but we're going to talk about endocrine kind of later on in the semester. Um, so there's um, a lot of stuff happening there, both endocrine and exocrine function. 
So again, that was like a big recap on anatomy. Um, there was some new stuff in terms of physiology, but really this was to kind of get you caught up, make sure you're all speaking the same language and prepared to dive into the physiology of the digestive system uh, next week. So hopefully that was helpful to you in some way. Um, in future weeks, I will make sure that this video is posted at the same time as uh, your slides so that it's all at once, um, but hopefully that will help.